Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming along. Um, we hope to have a very interesting discussion for you um, about critical infrastructure and the potential threats facing critical infrastructure um, in the UK and indeed in any country. Um, I'm going to start by inviting uh, Eugene Kaspersky, CEO of Kaspersky Lab, just to provide some context and to give us an overview of um, what are the potential threats facing critical infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, so thank you all for coming for our event and uh, I'm Eugene Kaspersky and have a very brief introduction about the main topic of what we're going to discuss today. So uh, everybody knows that there are cyber criminals which attack individuals, which attack businesses uh, and uh, all the cyber security was around that to protect the endpoints, protect the networks, uh, the traffic. Uh, unfortunately, that was not the end of the cyber threats evolution. Uh, now we're living in a time of a uh, growing number of attacks on the infrastructure. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we see more and more even very scary scenarios. Uh, and I split these attacks into two categories. Uh, the criminal attacks, the traditional crime uh, infects or manipulates industrial systems and cyber sabotage. Uh, the number of criminal attacks on industrial systems grows very quickly, uh, but unfortunately we don't see all the picture because in many cases the victims, they don't disclose the data or even don't know that. And the typical scenario of a criminal attack on industrial uh, environment, um, uh, for example, uh, sometimes they're very, very smart guys. Uh, for example, uh, they're uh, the volume of petrol depends on the temperature. So when they fuel the big tank, they, decrease, they hack the SCADA system, they decrease the temperature, so they have extra volume in the tank. So they then deploy the petrol to petrol station and they release the uh, petrol according to the real temperature and have two, three percent extra. Uh, when they load coal to the trains at the coal mine, they check the weight and they report different weights. So they technically steal coal from the coal mine. Uh, they steal grain in the same way. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a report from Europol about attack on Antwerp seaport. Uh, Latin American drug cartels, uh, they uh, hacked the system which managed their container unloading and they knew containers with cocaine and they were unloading containers with cocaine to the area they have access to, to take cocaine out of the containers. Uh, uh, the Somali pirates, they, some of them, they changed the strategy. They hijack ships, uh, but they don't take ransom for the crew and the ship. They know containers with the most expensive stuff, so they scan containers, they open these containers, they take this stuff out of there and run. So unfortunately, the traditional crime recognized the power of cyber. And we see there are more and more cases when the industrial systems, the production lines, transportation is under attack. And the second scenario, <coughs> sorry, the second scenario is uh, cyber sabotage or cyber terrorism. Uh, Fortunately, we, we have just a very few examples. Uh, fortunately, these attacks are not uh, counted by dozens. Maybe once a year, a couple of times a year, uh, we see the attacks which are very close to cyber, sabotage, cyber terrorism or definitely cyber sabotage. Uh, last year, there was cyber attack on Ukrainian power grid. And some regions, they had a blackout because of the cyber attack. Uh, so the bad guys, they shut down power and they wiped all the systems. So it wasn't possible to just restart the computer systems and manage the power, and power grid. Uh, the engineers had to physically go to their power transformation stations and physically turn it on because they had uh, the manual override. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, unfortunately, their modern systems, they don't have manual override. So if the same happens in Europe or United States, I'm afraid the problem will be even more serious. Uh, 
Uh, two years ago, there was a report from Germany about attack on the German steel mill. Unfortunately, we don't have any hard data, no details about this attack on the short report. In the report, they said that was a cyber attack on the office network. Then this attack came from the office network to industrial network. And they made some comments, they sent some instructions for emergent shutdown for the steel mill. Emergent shutdown for the steel mean, mill means, you know. Uh, there were attacks on the financial sector in South Korea a few years ago, uh, which is also critical infrastructure. It's not physical infrastructure, but anyway, it's a critical infrastructure. Uh, this year, there were attacks on hospitals uh, in uh, Australia, California, and Germany when the old data was wiped. That was criminal attack. But they wiped all the data in hospitals, and actually hospitals were paralyzed, which is very close to cyber terrorism. So unfortunately, we see three major scenarios of this kind of attacks. Attacks on the physical infrastructure, like a power plants, power grid, transportation. Attacks on the critical data, like financial services, healthcare, transportation as well, and attacks on telecommunications. Attacks on the internet, attacks on the mobile network. Uh, so there, situation in the cyberspace is getting worse and worse. Unfortunately, we are facing the more professional and very creative attacks. Uh, and now we are talking not just about the individual security, the business security, it's also about the industrial security. So now we have not just B2C, B2B, but also B2I. And the difference is, for individuals to protect your systems, it's very simple. Just click the link, download application, run it, that's it. For businesses, it's more complicated. You have to deploy solutions through the network to protect the gateways, endpoints, backups. For industrial sector, it's even much more complicated because it's not a product, it's a project. To protect industrial uh, segment, we have to design the security systems which are designed for particular industry. Even the two power plants, for example, or two oil refineries, they have a little bit different infrastructure. And we have to adapt technologies for these different infrastructure. So it's not a product to deploy, it's a project. And so we have a lot of work to do. And of course, we're, there is no nation in the world which has enough of engineers to adjust the industrial environment for the new types of threats, to protect industrial environment from the, from the new types of attacks. Uh, so one of our jobs is now to create the partner network uh, to start the education training centers uh, for their companies which develop SCADA systems, which are working with industrial environment, to share our knowledge, to share our technologies. Uh, and well, we just started, but uh, have already the good news. Uh, we have the first uh, training center just opened in Russia, in Tatarstan. Uh, so they are, it's mostly about the oil and gas uh, refineries. So we will have uh, special trainings uh, for the experts, for the IT people, engineers, cyber engineers from the gas and oil industry. Uh, so we just started that in Russia, and I think that, well, it's uh, just a very beginning. Uh, so we are about to have these training centers and the partner networks uh, everywhere around the world, because all the nations depend on the infrastructure. And infrastructure depends on the cyber systems. And cyber systems are vulnerable. So we need to redesign them in a more secure way uh, to make them immune. Uh, so unfortunately, we have a lot of work to do. OK, so thank you. That was very, uh, I can speak about these uh, issues for hours. We have much more stories and uh, ideas. Uh, but we have five, of, five of us are here to share our ideas, to share our knowledge, and to answer your questions. Thank you. Eugene, thank you very much for that uh, clear outline of, of what the problem is. Um, before we press on, I, I, I'd like to introduce uh, the other members of our panel, uh, and we have Jose Palazon, who's CTO of 11 Paths, uh, part of Telefonica. 
Um, we also have Kevin Weibert, who's uh, Industrial Control Systems Security Evangelist um, at Solutions PT. Um, we also have um, Andrew Comer from the Institute of Engineering. He's a member of the Institute of Engineering and a partner at Buro Hapold. Um, and also um, Andrea Tonini. And uh, Andrea is owner and sales director of BM Group. Um, so we have a good range of uh, knowledge, expertise, experience uh, in this. So hopefully we can have a, a very interesting discussion um, around this topic. Um, Eugene, you talked a lot about the, uh, the, the potential threats. What would you say about the perception, people's understanding of this threat? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I have a good news. Uh, so I have a bad news and good news. So now it's time for the good news. Uh, years ago, I had to explain what's going on with industrial security. Uh, when I was talking to the government representatives, uh, to the ministers, to CEOs, CTOs from the uh, industrial sector, I had to explain the uh, importance of the uh, extra security for industrial sector. Uh, not anymore. So now they do understand. Uh, so now when, sometimes there are funny cases when I'm ready to explain that to the minister, but I was wrong. The minister explains that to me. I'm happy. So the situation now is much better than years <coughs> ago, but still we're, we're on the very first stage. So I split in the three stages. First stage, the governments, the industries needs to understand the problem. The second stage is to design the strategy. And third stage, to implement the strategy. So most of the governments and industries, they are on the first stage, but close to the border to jump to the second one. That's the good news. OK, thank you, Eugene. Uh, Jose, what, um, what are your thoughts on this in terms of um, customers and what they believe about this problem? Are, are they thinking about it at all? And, and what are their concerns? Uh, they are. I mean, I mean, being from Telefonica, I'm here with two hats. One from an infrastructure, critical infrastructure provider, and I can share some insights on that later. Uh, the other being uh, 11 paths, we do cybersecurity. So our customers are actually uh, companies and businesses and governments that have reached to us because they're concerned about this. So we are looking at threat management, security management, vulnerabilities, uh, continuous testing, uh, penetration testing, that is. So they are definitely thinking about this and using not only our services, but many other companies' services to think about the problem, to do something before the problem. But also they are concerned about what happens if, even with the measures that you take, something happens. So they're also prepared to uh, do something when something happens. So prevention, mitigation, and then reaction. And investigation. Yeah. Thank you, um, Kevin. And any um, any other thoughts on that in terms of, uh, you know, thinking thinking with with the different hats you've got about perceptions of this problem, um, you know, in terms of in the industry as well as perception of clients. So if you ask me, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a, a huge range of clients uh, in manufacturing and industry uh, and critical national infrastructure. Uh, and people are really taking the steps to understand more and more and more about the problems. Uh, some of them are very aware of the problems, but due to, um, as, as Eugene was, was explaining earlier on, the complexity of the systems and the complexity of the attacks, um, it's a real big challenge for them. They can't just change overnight. They can't go and install systems. So for them, it's, uh, it's uh, really taking them on the uh, what we call the sort of the stairway to security uh, and if we can build more knowledge uh, in the industry it's going to help a lot okay great thank you um and, and andrew what what um, what what what's your perspective on this in terms of perceptions well i i guess i'm representing both my professional um institutions civil engineers and um and a, and a professional business in, who, who looks at uh, developing in build, building in cities across the uh, parts of cities across the planet. Um, by and large, I think in terms of the critical national infrastructure, um, as has been mentioned, you know, I think government has a fairly good understanding and grip on uh, what is likely to be required and, uh, and is um, 
has put in place, starting to put in place um, uh, the appropriate measures, and uh, and those within my part of um, the industry who are involved in critical national infrastructure um, have a, a, a beginning to get the appropriate training and understanding. I think at a more prosaic level, the level at cities and buildings, um, until probably the last five years, most of the focus has been on physical threat, the, the physical nature of threats, rather than thinking about cyber attacks and, uh, and, uh, and the, the, the challenge that the, the proliferation of, inf of, of technology is going to um, present. So that's something that's relatively new, and, and I would say uh, probably not having the thought being given to it at the moment that it certainly will be necessary over the next um, five to ten years. Um, so I, I can only see that this this part this this sort of element starting to be uh, be something that civil engineers, structural engineers, building building engineers need to get to grips with very quickly and and start to understand that in their general. Uh, day to day work. Okay, thank you very much. Now, uh, we'll be going on in a moment to talk about what organizations do about this problem. And um, uh, Andrea, I'll begin with you when we do that. But for the moment, uh, at this point, are there any questions from the floor on that, this issue of perception of the problem specifically? Uh, Richard Jackson from IHS Jane's Intelligence Review. Um, Eugene, you mentioned a couple of times about the fact we're lacking data and we just don't know how many attacks there are. We don't know always the details. From a traditional risk management perspective, understanding that likelihood and that the, the frequency and the, the, the trends in those attacks is how you would approach this problem. Does this mean that we need a new approach to risk management, a new approach to threat management in this, whereby we don't have an understanding of likelihood um, and we have to just work in a different way? Uh, well, actually, uh, uh, first of all, I think that there have to be more uh, government involved into that because I think that, for example, the German <coughs> government, they introduced a very, very right idea uh, that the enterprises, they must report about the most critical attacks. Uh, so still there are lack of their regulation, I think so. Uh, so that's why we, in some cases we're simply blind. But the second half of the problem is uh, I'm afraid many enterprises, they don't know that they are hacked. Especially if it's about SCADA systems, the industrial systems, uh, which they, well, they know how to handle attacks on the office network. They know what to do with the malware in the network. But when it comes to the industrial systems, they simply don't have any experience. And the problem is with the police forces as well. There is a cyber police handling their cases in the, with the cyber crime. And there is a traditional police with a with traditional crime, but attacks on the SCADA system, industrial cyber system, that's in, in between. So we have, we have many problems. Um, I, I'm going to press on because we need to get to, to, to our next section. And specifically, uh, our next area is what organizations need to do about this. and. Um, Andrea, I'm, I'm going to start with you um, on this. So, specifically, what do you think is the mission of the industrial system integrator in, in this issue? Thanks, David. Uh, today, we live the fourth uh, industrial revolution, or the Industrial 4.0. Your first characteristic is the vertical connection from the PLC to the SCADA, level one, to the level two, technology process, and uh, to the level three, mass, and today to the web. The connection on this device to the internet is a trend. The cybersecurity need to follow this trend. The system integrator of the future need to engineer new system in order to obtain smart assets, high productivity, and protect the system. Second, develop and integrate the protection on the existing plant in order to modernize the old industry and drive it on the cyber protection. The third is educate and prepare the figures involved in the fourth revolution in order to warranty the maximum result. But the first rules 
is change your head when you approach to a new project. For me, it's very important to transfer to you two messages coming from my customers' needs. The first is new obligated concept of quality of produ production. We are facing a new concept of quality. The quality is guaranteed by control of the process. The control of the process is checked by industrial automation. The industrial automation cannot be safe without a cybersecurity platform. So, we can declare the quality of a product if we are not able to assure the cyber safety and security. The second is new obligated concept or of safety of production. It's the same concept. In the same way, we can declare that an operator can work in safe condition because his work tool is in the industrial automation interface. In the automation is not safe and protected. The operator can't do his job in safe condition. Today, old industry is in front of new step. The obligate necessary to immediately implement a cyber security platform. Vertical for the, for the industrial process, for the sensor to the internet. Thank you for your attention. Andrea, thank you. Um, Jose, within, within your sector, um, I'm interested to kind of get your feedback on what industries have in place currently to, to try and deal with the problem of attack and, and how, how to protect themselves. Okay, so I guess in, coming from an operator, from a telecommunications operator, uh, the regulation is, is very strong. It's, very, it's a sector that is very hardly regulated. That means that we are, by default, very resilient. So the homologation, the management of the changes, change control and stuff like that. So that, I guess, works in our favor when you face something relatively new, such as security and stuff. I mean, it's, it's not new at all, but compared to the existence of, of the actual networks. So uh, I don't know, for example, if we are to throw a cable to go through three countries in South America, you can just throw the line, and then if the line is cut, then you might have a huge outage. But you can also build a ring, and then if the cable is cut, then you can go the other way of the ring. Uh, if we miss a submarine cable, then we can use an earth link, or you can use a satellite link. Uh, we, are, we have heavy SLAs. We cannot just decide that you are going to be able to call 112 or, nine, or 999 or just 95% of the time. This is not an option. We cannot just decide what to put in our, in our level agreements. Um, and then there's the other operators as well. I mean, we obviously compete for our customers, but we also help each other in terms of maintaining the infrastructure. So we do have agreements between each other to support when, when you fall, then you can use their infrastructure. So we, we interact in that way. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, but what about the smart, smart uh, criminals or smart uh, uh, bad guys? Uh, they don't need to cut the line. They just need to wipe the firmware on, uh, yeah, yeah, on yeah. the routers, yes, for yeah. example. Absolutely. Well, yeah. uh, uh, I'm working in IT security for many yeah. years. So I have uh, two halves of the brain. One Absolutely. half of the brain is about security. Yeah. The second half of the brain is to design new types of attacks. Absolutely. So yeah. when the, uh, and, uh, as I said before, I'm coming here with two hats. One is the infrastructure yes, provider. Yeah. The other is the cyber security guy, same as you. Uh, there are. There are three or four things that affect to that apply to every industry, like the and things that we security professionals have been saying for I don't know 15, 20 years. Uh, priorities prioritize security as part of your process when you design. Um, the fact that you do security in depth, you can you put many layers of security, knowing that they are going to fail at some point. Uh, you, some of your measurements, some of your security measurements are going to compromise. So if you only rely on one layer of security, then you're in trouble. So applying different layers of security 
um, think about security as a process, not as a one-off. Don't yeah. hire yeah. someone yeah. to just do something for you in the conception, or even if you have a problem, and then it's like, okay, now I have a problem, and I'll fix it, investigate, apply measurements, and then forget about it mm -hmm. until the next problem. Sure. Security is a process. So those apply to absolutely every industry. The one thing that I maybe believe that is a bit more, well, not, not, really, not unique, but critical for this is uh, understanding the motivations and the resources of people that might want to compromise the security of a critical infrastructure. Because if you look at the, I don't know, if you look at Doku, or du Doku is it? Regin, uh, Stagnex of course, and uh, any of the kind of malware that have made the general media, those contain a, such an amount of advanced technology and zero days that most companies believe that the only way you can create one of those is being funded by a government, right? Uh, so that's, that's in terms of the, the resources that people that is attacking this infrastructure have. And then of, in terms of the impact that something has, um, this is human lives, right? So sometimes if you're designing the controller that is gonna decide if you're selling or buying electricity from your wind turbine, you're not thinking about human lives, but if someone compromises a thousand wind turbines in the field, then you might leave an entire city without electricity and think about the consequences, right? So. Okay. We have a very short command. Actually, this, uh, you just mentioned a very uh, serious issue. Uh, in a big enterprises, in the industrial sector, there are different departments which sometimes they don't talk to each other, the automation, the IT, security. So we have a very simple solution for that. We have a table game which simulates attack on a water pump and another game, another version of the game is the gas turbine. So it's like a, uh, the team is from IT, from there's the chief engineer, the chief IT and chief security, three of them. And they, uh, like in the situation when they just bought this enterprise and the enterprise is under attack, they have budget, they have time and they have options to do. And this is the game. So they have to find a way how to protect the enterprise. And after that, after this game, they become the best friends. They understand that they have to talk to each other. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, that, that's, that's really interesting. Picking up on that, Eugene, uh, putting a question to you, Andrew. You, you talked earlier about the engineering side of this uh, in terms of what needs to be done. To, to what extent do you think there's an open door? I mean, are, are, are people... Um, in your view, receptive to the need to, to, to be addressing this? Uh, very much so. I think um, there's, there's, uh, the industry um, has historically been very collaborative. Um, the, there is a you know, recognition that um, it's, it's very difficult in one person to fi find, find an individual who can cover a lot of technical ground and uh, understand the complexities. Uh, not just the physical infrastructure, but the interrelationships between them. So, you know, I know um, the the, uh, the current um, director general of our institution is uh, starting to reach out across the the normal um, boundaries of, of, of what we would consider our boundaries in terms of engineering to start to talk and engage with other uh, professional bodies to encourage that form of collaboration because it's the, the, the situation is only going to get more and more complex. As, as we move forward. And I think, as everyone seems to have mentioned, collaboration is going to be a key, a key um, component of, of, uh, of uh, starting to understand and prevent um, really serious issues. I think equally understanding and adopt, you know, we as, a, as an industry, we, we try to promote and, and uh, identify best practice and and to adopt those best practices. So learning not just within our own profession, but from other prof professions about what the best, best, best practice should be telling us to do. Great, okay, Andrew, thank you. Thank you all for your input on that. O on that, that second section then, drawing that to a close, the issue of what needs to happen uh, in terms of protection, uh, are, are there any questions from the floor? We'll take the ones that came up first, so please thank go ahead. You. Um, Catherine Smell, I work for New Civil Engineer magazine. So, Andrew, you said kind of civil engineers and structural engineers, and they need to incorporate it into their kind of day-to-day -day basis in their life. Um, what kind of things can they do on the day-to-day -day basis to kind of incorporate this into their work? And also, kind of what should what kind of threats should they personally be looking out for? 
But I think, I think in a way, uh, the part of the challenge is going to be for our, in, uh, our um, industry to start to think much more long-term and broadly about the education of engineers. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a great believer that we should be encouraging, for instance, computer sciences to run alongside engineering uh, degrees because more it's going to be a valuable um, uh, and, and critical elements of our training in, for the future. At the moment, I would say uh, there is a, a, a limited degree of understanding of, of, of technology, its impacts, and, uh, and, and more importantly, the consequences of getting things wrong at the moment. But, but by and large, we, we are starting to see a, a bigger and better collaboration with, with um, security teams, with, uh, with IT specialists. So I, th I think there's, a, there's, an, there's already a, a process that's, that's ongoing. I think there's, but, but it needs, there's an industry we need to rethink the whole way in which um, we're, 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 we're being trained and, uh, and, and, and exercising. I think in terms of, I'm sorry, the second part of the question was day to day, well, to, to date, as I say, historically, most of the threats have been, I would, I would suggest, have been physical, of a physical nature. And, and I think generally the profession is starting, has, has got a good understanding of how to, how to design in safety and security. I think as it's only over, as I said earlier, only over the last four or five, six years that a dawning recognition has, has, has occurred that we are, we're starting to become more and more reliant on on technology and ICT, um, the, the 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 way in which I think most people tackle it at the moment is to make sure there's a great deal of resiliency and, re and redundancy built into what, in fact, in most buildings and, and cities, a relatively dumb I would argue dumb, relatively dumb uh, uh, layers of infrastructure. They will they will work. You know, we will continue to be able to drive around our cities if. <laughs> If the uh, if the uh, ICT the the, 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 net, the the intelligent transport networks go down, you may get some problems at, at gridlock at, at junctions. But by and large, our cities will continue to function in one way or another, albeit very uncomfortably. But in the but 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 there will be growing risk of real e economic uh, interference, and 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 we just need to be alive and alert to that growing possibility and start to be able to. Gra grapple much more, be, be, be able to understand much more um, how to deal with those threats. And I think it will be through collaboration, education, um, and, uh, and just a broader depth of knowledge. Um, I'd like to lead into our, our third section. Um, and really, uh, to a greater or lesser degree, depending on which country in Europe or across the world we are, critical infrastructure is in the hands of private enterprises rather than state controlled. Um, so within that, um, I, I'd like to get the panel's feel for um, what they think the state's role in this is. Um, you know, what, what, what can the state do, what can governments do, and what should they be doing to, to try to raise awareness and, and maybe, you know, going even further, maybe into regulation? You, you oh. Yeah, uh, uh, my point is that uh, their uh, critical infrastructure, it's about national security, it's about global security, global economy. Uh, so their leading role, I think that's have to be done by government because, well, they are responsible for the national security, national economy. Um, actually, they collect taxes, so they have to <laughs> be responsible for that. And uh, I think that the very first step is uh, to, well, understand the problem, uh, to, uh, well, educate people, educate enterprises, uh, and then to design the cyber strategy, uh, how to protect the critical infrastructure, how to make it immune. Uh, and, uh, of course, it's a lot of work. It's not just a small, small a short document, a recommendation. It has to be done. Uh, well, it's a lot of work to do uh, because it has to describe their security audits, uh, the education, the trainings, uh, the cybersecurity technologies and services. Uh, there are many things have to be done, uh, and uh, I think that same like uh, like the buildings. Then the companies build the buildings. They have a standards, they have regulation, they have responsibilities and penalties. 
uh, when the companies design cyber systems, they do it as they want to do, correct? There is reg no regulation at all. So I think the, one of the important steps for governments is to introduce any kind of regulation for the cyber systems which manage the critical infrastructure. Because now it's zero. Am I right? Uh, for example, the typical mistake, say there is a turbine, and engineers, they have a schedule. Once for some period of time, once a year, they have to come to this turbine and to check mechanical stuff there, to replace it, to check the oil pressure, or what, what else is there. They have to done. They have to do something with the physical, mechanical environment. What about computer systems? They work, don't touch. So at the end, they recognize that the airport is partly managed by Windows 3.1 system, like Orly Airport in France. Do you remember the Orly Airport was stopped because the system responsible for the weather forecast, as far as I remember? Yeah, yes, it stopped. And they came to the system and said, what? Surprise! Microsoft Windows 3.1. Do you remember that? <coughs> there are still MS-DOS systems in some, some places. Do you know that? And they don't, don't touch, don't touch, it works, come on. The computer systems, they are parts of the physical environment. So if, well, actually we, the engineers must to check mechanical components, and they must to check software as well, and redesign the systems. Not like now where uh, there is a demand on Fortran engineers. Yeah? A uh, couple of years ago, there was in social media, there was like a, uh, the message from, as far as I remember, from Canadian Nuclear Agency. They were looking for PDP-11 engineers. Do you remember PDP-11? How many people in this room still remember what the PDP-11 is? <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry for being long, but that's uh, what's going on with the cyber in industrial environment. It's the mess. Nothing done, correct? Yeah, yeah. Hi. So um, in financial technology right now, ransomware is a big hot topic. I'm wondering if uh, that could transition from digital to physical spaces in terms of infrastructure, sort of sealing areas off or? It actually just happened, I think it was last week or two weeks ago. Uh, when this did this, um, what is this city in the States that are having problems with lead and water? and yeah. they're all drinking mineral yeah, dosing, water. Water dosing uh, system. Right? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. The day after, so Anonymous, the, the uh, activist group, made a, a threat about attacking one of the hospitals in the city, and the next day they were, they were infected by malware. So it's not 100% correlated, but it just happened. Uh, attacks on hospitals. Three attacks this year on the hospitals in the United States, in Australia, and in Germany. Uh, so there's a real facts, and uh, I'm afraid there are more and more scenarios uh, we will see in the future. Uh, for example, well, uh, it, well, it's not a just science fiction because it's coming. Automatic ships and suddenly pirates to hijack the automatic ship by hacking the system. Is it possible? Why not? When you have a smart house, how many people live in smart house already? Do you think your kids will live in smart house? Yes, I think so. So to hijack a smart house and ask for ransom. So there are many different scenarios. There are many scenarios how to do that. And actually that's, the, well, the ransom problem is now is rising. Uh, so they're bad guys, they recognized it as one of the most safe uh, way how to have a profit from victims, how to earn money. Uh, and unfortunately, in some cases, it's very hard to trace them. Uh, they use a cryptocurrency to take ransom, so it's very hard to trace the, this. Ah, we are fighting with these guys. But unfortunately, in some cases, they are winning. Sorry. Don't pay ransom. Better have uh, better security trainings for employees, and backups, which are not connected to network. Hi there, uh, Danny Palmer from ZDNet. We've talked about um, two um, strong themes here, the role of nation states and the role of collaboration. Um, 
But how can we actually go about solving this issue of protecting crystal infrastructure when a lot of nation states are really suspicious of each other? Uh, as a Russian citizen, I, I can well, I can answer this uh, address this issue. Well, actually, what's going on on the political level? Sometimes it doesn't reflect on the technical level. For example, cyber police from Russia, from United States, from Europol, they are cooperating like on a daily basis. They don't have political problems. When they face the same enemy, the same problem, they work together. And the political issues, they, are, they stay behind the door. Correct? Hi, Jaime Concha from Energy Intelligence. Um, in regards to oil and gas and to the private versus state dichotomy, in, in a low oil and gas price environment, uh, some oil and gas companies might not be willing to do this investment at the moment. So what are the costs of all of this? It's nice to talk about it, but what are the costs for the private enterprises? What's the cost for the government? How does this influence the future of everything that you're talking about? Because it's nice to dream about it, but for commercial companies, it's not the, or at least for oil and gas companies, it's not the best moment to think about this. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I'm, I think you're not 100% uh, correct about gas and oil. After Saudi Aramco attack, gas and oil companies, they, for them, it's uh, cybersecurity, one of the top priorities. Uh, once, uh, it was the next year after Saudi Aramco attack, uh, it was uh, their dedicated stream in a World Economic Forum in Davos. It was a gas and oil cyber security. And the representatives were the C CEOs and presidents of gas and oil companies. There were only two IT guys in the room, the CEO of British Telecom and, and me. And so they were, uh, I started my speech with a... Uh, uh, I had a very, very short speech, and I said, okay, so I'm not, I'm not expert in the gas and oil industry, but I guess you IT systems, they are connected in this way, or they are connected that way. They said, yes, yes, you're right. And then the presidents and CEOs of, from gas and oil, they started to talk in a cybersecurity language. They were talking about zero days, vulnerabilities, penetration tests. So they learned all that. So don't worry about gas and oil industry. They are aware about the problem. How much does it cost? Uh, I'm afraid uh, this is not the, it's not a project, as was mentioned. Yeah. It's a process. So it's not possible to introduce the 100% security and forget about that. It will not work. We have to do it again and again. Start with a penetration test and security audit to understand where these are their most vulnerable points in your organization. Uh, trainings for employees, table game for chief engineer, chief security, and chief IT guy. Uh, it, it really works. Uh, then build the plan, the strategy, how to redesign the systems in an immune way, how to make them absolutely secure. Not all of them, but it's too expensive. But parts by parts, component by component. And in this case, there have to be companies to work together. There was cooperation between the industrial sector, their companies, IT companies, which build solutions for the industrial sector, and security companies working together. And this is a project. And it doesn't have the price list because all the enterprises, all the industries, they are different. I recently was in a uh, chemical factory. They said, OK, it's not just one factory. It's seven different factories on the same territory with the different technological processes, which were made in different ages, which used different computer systems. So the every part of that needs a dedicated solution. So that's, again, it's not, it's not easy. It's not cheap. We don't have enough of engineers, but we need to do it. Thank you, Eugene. At, at this point, um, I need to draw things to a close. Um, I, I would like to thank all the members of the panel. Um, I think it's been an interesting discussion, uh, both in terms of perception out there, in terms of what needs to be done. So thank you again to the panel, and thank you for coming. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.